Hello once again, welcome to this edition of the broadcast Chat Night Africa. We have interesting stuff for you and uh, we have a powerhouse to take your questions. We would like to make this very, very interactive. And so if you have questions, do not hesitate to uh, lock them across and I will take those questions to the specialist Dr. B. Tatsong Fomundam. This day on Chat Night Africa, we will be talking about food poisoning. You perhaps went somewhere, ate some fish, some dole, came back home and could not sleep. It felt like you and death were on the same bed. Well, sometimes that's what is called food poisoning. Exactly what we're about to talk about today on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, if you eat at a restaurant, if you buy vegetables from a grocery store, if you preserve food in your refrigerator to eat later on, you ought to pay attention. The difference between life and death could just be razor thin. I'm talking about food poisoning. Ladies and gentlemen, it's about to get very breezy. Get ready, ready, steady, go. Appears on the show. Hello, dog. Good to see you. Hello, Hello. How are you doing, sir? I'm feeling good, and uh, I feel great, especially as you are coming for us to talk about matters that matter. You know, when you talk about food handling, that could mean the difference between life and death. Absolutely. Thank you, my friend, for coming on Chat Night Africa today. Um, who is Dr. B. Tanzong Pomundam? Please introduce yourself to the audience. What's your area of specialization? So my area of specialty is general preventive medicine and public health. And uh, that's why I'm coming in to talk about uh, food poisoning today. Um, I was born in Cameroon, grew up there, came here when I was 17. And just like everybody else, fought hard prayed and somehow got opened away and I was able to make it through medical school. Had a very interesting pathway, but um, I'm happy that it landed me with preventive medicine because it means the world to me right now. Uh, I see that it's a way that you can definitely make a change in people's lives and actually benefit more people than taking care of individuals. So this is exciting. When you talk about preventive medicine, what, what do you mean? Break that down. All of us didn't go to medical school. So many people watching, they don't, they don't know what preventive medicine is. I mean, what is it? So I'm going to put it this way. You know, when our parents and grandparents were growing up, they didn't have a lot of access to health care, but they lived pretty good lives. And it's because they were dealing, they were living more on the preventive side. So preventive medicine is looking at, it's the only specialty in medicine where you can zoom in and zoom out. Zoom in means you can take care of an individual and zoom out means you can look at the general population health and determine how to improve the health of more people than just one person. Well, the saying goes that health is wealth. Wealth begins with good health. Uh, Dr. Fumundam, I know what it is to get up in the morning and not be able to go to work. Um, once it struck me and struck me very, very hard. That's a different story. When we talk about food poisoning, what do you mean? So I'm going to give you a simple definition and then I'll categorize it because I think people need to understand the basic, the basic definition from a, an everyday standpoint. So basically food poisoning is any kind of illness that occurs after ingestion of some kind of food or basically something that goes through your mouth. So these are the three conditions. One, the food has to have some kind of contamination for most cases. Number two, somebody has to take it into their mouth. And it's not just food, anything that goes to your mouth, including water. And, and then it has to make you sick for it to be called food poisoning because there are some people who eat contaminated food and they don't get sick. But for most people, something will happen to them and the degree, the degree of the illness varies with different groups of people. So you have to have some kind of contamination of food. It has to be ingested by somebody and the person has to get sick to categorize it as food poisoning. Now, I just found out too that uh, the CDC kind of considers food allergies as food poisoning because it is illness that is caused by food. But the difference is that the food is not contaminated, but the person's body rejects it. 
Wow, that's beautiful. Um, a lot of people watching this broadcast are from Africa, different countries in Africa. Um, you go to a, uh, a ceremony and you eat ndole or fish and come back home and you cannot sleep. Well, the tendency is to say that somebody was poisoned. At, so is being poisoned the same as food poisoning? You, you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about. And yes, it is considered as one of the ways that food poisoning can occur. So sometimes it's, it's accidental and sometimes it's deliberate. Like with the one where somebody puts in a chemical or toxin into the food. So yes, it is food poisoning. Remember, food poisoning is any kind of illness that is caused by something that goes through your mouth. Now, you talk, you, you talk about, you know, it has to be to have been contaminated and so on. How do you know that the food that you eat could be contaminated or has been contaminated? I mean, generally what we do is we smell it, you take it and smell it. If, it, if the odor isn't what, it doesn't, it isn't fresh, the suspicion is that it's bad, it's gone bad. Um, is that the way you quickly say, hey, look, this isn't something for me to eat or you look at the expiration date? Um, actually, those are all the last stages of checking for food, for food contamination. There are many things that happen in between when the food goes into the ground and when it actually gets into your plate. And along that pathway, there are many ways to contaminate the food that you may not be able to pick up. For example, if a lettuce has some kind of bacteria on it, you probably wouldn't notice it if the lettuce is still fresh off the, 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 the market. You know, you wouldn't notice any smell or anything. But that's where public health comes in because the goal of public health is to monitor for any illnesses in the public, to investigate, to promote health and to prevent. So that is why we need public health so much because they pick up problems before we can actually identify them. What are, what are some other ways that food gets contaminated? I mean, I know that you, you sometimes you put these things in the fridge or you didn't cover it well or you didn't steam it in the morning. What are some of the things, the intricacies in uh, food contamination? What are other ways these things could be contaminated, Doug? So, right from the farm, food can be poisoned. How? For example, How so? if you have soil that is contaminated, you know, sometimes like, there are chemicals in the soil that contaminate food, that could cause food poisoning. Then also, it depends on what kind of materials are used to feed the plants when they're growing. For example, water and fertilizer and all those things. Sometimes people use animal, animal products to fertilize the, the, the plants and those animal products may be contaminated. That's another source of contamination. Sometimes it's the water. They may be getting water from a dirty source and that water will contaminate the food. So that is the first step. The next step is harvesting. You know, who knows what they use to harvest sometimes. People may use dirty knives, they may use dirty um, equipment to harvest or to pick up the food from the farm. That food could get contaminated again. Then storage. How do you keep the food before you get it to where you want it to go? And we know that a lot of times here we would get food to be transported in very specific temperatures, especially in different weather. And it's really pertinent in warm weather because when the weather is warm, food rots faster. So even the food from the farm, bacteria, because the reason is because bacteria, germs and everything else tend to grow faster in warm temperatures. So if we transport the food the wrong way, we could contaminate it, it could come out just fine from the farm, but by the time it gets to the store or the, or the market, it's already contaminated. And then the other thing is between when it's kept in the store and when somebody buys it, how do they handle the food? How do they store it? That's another source of contamination. Then when somebody buys the food and takes it home, a lot of people make this mistake. And the only reason I learned it was because I did public health and preventive medicine. We do not know how to handle food. From when you buy it in the market, you buy your vegetables, you put it right next to the fresh meat and all the, the fresh animal products or dairy. And right there, you could have what we call cross-contamination. The other thing that happens when you put that food in the refrigerator, you could have some more contamination. There's a specific way that you store food in the refrigerator to prevent contamination. So things that are already cooked should be kept at the top. Then fresh vegetables can go next, and then things like meat and dairy products should go in the bottom. Because if anything drips out of them, you don't want them to get onto the fresh foods or the already cooked foods. And then the other way that we, we, we can contaminate food is preparation. If you don't prepare it right, because foods have a way that they ought to be prepared. 
and if it once you prepare it, if you don't handle it right, so you could contaminate it. So there are many ways that we can contaminate food without even realizing it. This is very scary because you see, when I go do grocery shopping, I just come back home and I just jam box load it in the fridge <laughs> anyhow, anyway. I have never ever thought that there's a way you would really ought to pack food in the fridge so as to prevent what you describe here as cross contamination. Before we get to that, Dr. Uh, Dr. Um, B. Tatsung um, uh, Fomundam, let's talk a little bit about uh, watering of food. Because back home, and there are people who practice petty little agriculture back home, they're planting tomatoes, vegetables. Even in the United States, behind their backyards, people are planting. My understanding until this evening has been that plants, food growing that you planted can be watered with just about anything. How is it that the kind of water that you use in watering your food becomes a, a contaminant, a source of contamination to the food that you hope to harvest someday? What happens? So there are many ways that this happens. One of them, for example, which is the problem too with policy, if you don't have a good sewage system, you have you have septic tanks right next to places where people are growing food. Guess where all of that water seeps into? Because everything in the soil seeps. It slowly seeps downhill or wherever. And and so when you have, for example, um, an untreated sewage, which tends to have a lot of stuff going on in it, bacteria and heaven knows what else, it seeps into this place where you planted your vegetables and so on. Guess what? Whatever is in that water, in that sewage, and the water that went through is going to become a problem for your plants. The other thing is that um, sometimes you may not have sewage close by, but you may be getting water from a contaminated source. A lot of farms, they tend to not just have animals, they have plants on there too. So if you have animals, let's say they're uphill, and you have your plants downhill, and the animals are letting go of all their, all their poop uphill, and it's, and it's falling on the ground, it's contaminated. Water that goes into the, on, the, on the poop seeps down into the vegetables. This has happened multiple times. And then there's something else that I found that was really scary. The first time I saw it, I was blown up. So tomatoes, that's a special one. You know the seeds of tomatoes do not digest in the human body. I never knew that. When you what? eat tomatoes, the seeds of tomatoes do not, they are not broken down. They, they go in as seeds and they come out as seeds. So I went, we went to um, inspect a sewage plant when I was doing my training in preventive medicine and I saw tomatoes growing very nicely in the dried sewage and I told the guys, I said, who planted that stuff over there? That is crazy. Who plants tomatoes in dried poop? And the guy started laughing and said, nobody planted it. The seeds of tomatoes do not get digested. So when people poop, it's in the poop and when they take poop and they, and they, they treat sewage, they actually sieve it. So they get the water out. They, they, they get out the, the hard the hard stool and they let it dry out and then they treat it and then the one that they see they also treat it they, 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 the they have to do a lot of things to treat it before letting it back into the into the system so when this poop is dried out you go there you see tomatoes growing there you know this is tomatoes that somebody ate and it came out in their poop and it's, in the, it's growing in the dry so right there if you had anything going on in that poop guess what it's going to go on the tomatoes and I know that people who are probably going to say you know what these tomatoes can be sold. I'm going to make good money. This is a sewage plan. I don't have to worry about anything. They will harvest it and come sell it in the market. So those are some of the ways that things can get contaminated right from the farm. Now, back home, when we plant vegetables, say, well, cows used to be red, maybe near a cattle fence. We take the cow dung and kind of fertilize the vegetables. We use as fertilizers. Is this dangerous practice? I, I'm getting really scared. I mean, as we were talking, I, I, I got pushed to the edge of my seat because I'm like, oh my God, we are in trouble. If these are all the ways that people get food poisoning, then we are in trouble. You're right, but we cannot live in fear because there are so many things that could go wrong. First of all, there's something called grace. I'm a Christian, I believe in grace. You know, God is gracious. But beyond that, we have ways of minimizing these risks. And one of them is through public health where we inspect, we just need to be committed to doing the right things. Let's make sure that the sewage is treated properly. Let's make sure that things like cow dung, um, you know, is, 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 is tested for, for any kind of uh, poisoning. And if, if you're a farmer and you have your, your cows that are not feeling well, you shouldn't really be collecting their dung to use to fertilize plants. It has to, we have to make sure it's not contaminated before we use it on those plants. Now, let's talk about pesticides. 
Because we hear about wash your fruits very well, wash your vegetables very well. Can pesticides become a problem of food poisoning? You, you, you go to our markets, most, almost every food, vegetable, fruit, whatever that's sold, you have pesticides used. What should we do when we buy fruits, vegetables from our markets? What should we do? Okay. Mr. Chairman Kong, let me go back a little bit to this whole thing about food poisoning because it's going to tie into the question you just asked me. Okay. A lot of times when people think about food poisoning, they just think, oh, you know, I ate maybe a few hours ago or a few days ago and I got really sick. Food poisoning is a spectrum of illnesses. It can go from a few days to years, depending on what kind of poisoning you get. So that means that anything that is going into your mouth that contaminates your body, any kind of toxin, can cause problems. Now, the pesticides are a problem. They may make you sick depending on how much you spray it on that food immediately. But if they spray, they didn't spray enough to, to hurt you in the beginning. If you keep taking it in, the amount adds up in your system and slowly you're building a certain amount of toxins. So it may become a problem over years. People are going to start showing symptoms of these problems. A classic example, and this one is a natural toxin. Arsenic, this is something that we find in rat poison. It's also natural, it occurs naturally in the soil. So that's why, you know, with rice, you really have to be careful because rice tends to grow inside the soil and rice tends to accumulate a decent amount of toxin on it. That's why they say be careful how much you eat and so on. Um, when you eat that small amount after they've, they've, they've treated the rice, you may not have any problem, but over the years, it adds up and eventually it may become a problem for you beginning with children and going all the way to adults. So yes, pesticides can be a very big problem. In fact, in the US now we have a problem with um, this pesticide they call Roundup. I don't know if you've heard about it. Yeah, I heard about it. They're, they're beginning to find that substance called glyphosate. They're finding it even in children's cereals. General Mills is one of the companies. I used to give those things to my children and I just said, this is enough. I can't keep doing this. I know now and I'm not going to keep doing it. So yes, pesticides and all those chemicals that we use on plants can become a problem with food down the line. And I'm still going to talk about, I'm still going to ask you a follow-up on this pesticides thing. If farmers are using all those things, chemicals to spray, uh, tomatoes, vegetables, carrots, uh, uh, um, cabbage, all kinds of stuff like that. When you go buy those things from the market, it, it, what do you what should you wash it with is there something that you can use to wash these things with to at least clear if not everything most of the pesticides of the well, foods i'm not sure what we have back at home for washing things here they have a few things that you can use to wash stuff but i always ask myself what did they put i, I in can't wait to in? hear that Doug. what did they put in that mm. stuff anyways you know we have uh, veggie washes in many different stores a lot of the organic stores are carrying stuff like that mm. but i think that we have to look at the whole system. It's a system where people are trying to produce a lot more and they're trying and, and, and it's not sustainable because when you have to produce a large amount, you have to prevent the food from getting contaminated and you want to have enough produce to sell in the market and generate income, that pushes people to do certain things. You know, so I think one of the ways that we can solve that problem too is identifying people that use pesticides. I know when I was growing up, there were some times when my, my mother would go to the market and say, I do not buy Jama Jama from so and so place because these people put a lot of stuff in their food. And once we, you know, we, we, we put a red mark against these people, we are also sending a message to them that we are not going to be eating this kind of food. We will not tolerate you contaminating your food. We know, we, want, we know you want to sell food, but we don't want you to contaminate the food when you sell it to us. This is Chat Night Africa and the treasure trove of information we are drilling deep, like we dig gold, um, uh, is Dr. Uh, B. Tatsong Fomunda. I'm specialized in preventive medicine. That's why we thought she'd be the most appropriate person to discuss food poisoning. Um, Rosetta Ade, writing from Delaware, uh, poses a question. Hello. Doctor, Doctor, how long would it take for someone to react to food contamination? It can go from about... It can go from about 30 minutes to weeks. Remember what I mentioned before? There are some, so it depends on, we are, we're, we're going to get to that when we talk about the kind of things that are common, uh, commonly known to cause food poisoning. But it can go just from a few hours, a few, few minutes, half an hour to days and weeks, depending on what kind of organism or what kind of chemical cause the poisoning. Okay. A lot of people watching this broadcast, Dr. B. Uh, Tazong Pamundam, come from Africa. 
and you go buy grocery from Bamenda or Boya or somewhere in Malawi or somewhere in Yaounde, Douala, you see these things are sold near mountain mountains of garbage. Could that be some way that people get exposed to food poisoning? Absolutely. And I'm sure probably in Liberia or in Sierra Leone it's the same thing. Same scenario. Absolutely. Absolutely. Remember how we talked about food handling? Putting your food beside garbage. You have flies going back and forth. You may have some rodents because when you have garbage, everybody everybody's trying to get something out of the garbage, you know. The rodents are coming in there, the flies are coming in there, everything is coming in there. And I'm pretty sure that you don't do everything possible to prevent them from coming to your food. So that is definitely a way that contamination can occur. And it's something that is tied also to policy because if one person can say, well, I'm going to clean my part of the market, everybody, it has to become a policy thing where we say this place has to be clean. If you're going to be carrying food around here, it has to be clean enough that our food does not get contaminated when you bring it around this area. Um, I know this might embarrass you, but I, I, I just want to say uh, through this broadcast, thank you to uh, the former government delegate to the Bamenda Urban Council, Pat Tazong Ebende, that's your dad. Um, I was in Bamenda, Cameroon, when he did a spectacular job in the urban municipality in clearing garbage and the town was so clean. If you go to Bamenda now, you are fighting with rodents. You just can't drive around town without hitting mountains of garbage so i want to thank your dad for the phenomenal job he did when he was government delegate to the bamenda open council bamenda was one of the cleanest cities in cameroon if not the cleanest at the time he was government delegate to the bamenda open council uh, thank you i i appreciate your dad and i appreciate you coming on the show doc now the other question thank i wanted you, to ask you is what are the symptoms how do you know that you have food poisoning after returning from that party at midnight you know we africans we like to party at midnight and we're eating yeah. at 1 a.m 2 a.m could that be some of the reasons or ways uh, that um, we uh, contract this food poisoning we eat so late that ndole has been exposed there all day so you're right eating late has its own set of problems but the real problem is the, the handling of the food because when they bring it in most of those people probably don't know how to handle the food from when they actually took it to, from the whoever prepared the food to when they brought it to the hall and kept it sitting out there for long, a lot of times they are not aware, unless you have a trained um, food handler, a lot of times they are not aware how to handle the food. For example, when you have those foods, they found that bacteria grows very fast, between 40 and 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So if it's cold food, you have to keep it cold. If it's hot food, you have to keep it hot. And cold means below 40. Hot means above 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Most people don't really bother to do that. And then you have it open, people are coming in there and they're sticking things in and out. You don't know who has done what to it. You don't know what kind of flies or rodents have gone through, gone by the food. So yes, it's really not just the lateness problem, it is the exposure, the, the long-standing exposure and um, poor monitoring of the food once it's put out there for people to eat. This is Chat Night Africa and my guest is Dr. B. Tatzong from Mundam. We'll be doing a series of shows because uh, uh, she's very much involved in public health and talk about public health and you're talking about uh, prevention and talk about prevention well the old saying goes prevention is better than cure um, I'm your host D Divine Chamakong I want to thank all of you for coming to watch the show please if you think this can help somebody save somebody's life share invite tag um, let me what are some of the diseases that are associated with food poisoning I okay. mean, the one I know quickly is uh, stomach ache. And usually I go for uh, Pepto-Bismol, or how do you call it? I'm not a medical <laughs> doctor, excuse me. Sometimes I'll take ginger uh, and drink. And, I mean, I'm just putting concoctions together. Now, what are some of the illnesses, diseases associated with food poisoning, Doc? So um, the most common symptoms, I think like stomach cramping, stomach ache, maybe some nausea or vomiting, some diarrhea maybe a low grade fever and just difficulty handling food but for most people these symptoms would pass within 24 to 48 hours the most important thing during that time is to stay hydrated because the biggest problem you have with, with food poisoning is dehydration that is the biggest problem meaning that okay let me just back up a little bit human being is um, about 70 percent water now can you imagine if we 
wringed out most of the water from your body. That's what diarrhea, that's what uh, fluid loss does to you when you have food poisoning, when you're vomiting and you're, you're, you have diarrhea and so on. You're literally losing a ton of fluid from your body and you have to be able to replace it. So those are the more uh, common and less severe symptoms. And then we move on to more severe symptoms, the kind that land people in the hospital and actually make some people not come back to the world of the living. So um, I would say those are the most common things that we should worry about. Now, if you start having high grade fevers, or you have severe diarrhea, or you start noticing blood in your stool, or you're so sick, your, your stomach is hurting so badly that you can't even sit still, or you feel like I'm not able to hold anything down, you need to go in and see your doctor because at this point you're becoming you're becoming toxic and, and it's not going to get better without some kind of medical intervention. Uh, Rosetta Ade is asking if food poisoning or some of these diseases a food poisoning linked to respiratory dis uh, distress? Um, not very commonly, but I'll tell you something. When we talk about some of the complications of food poisoning, it could happen in very severe cases where people wind up with toxic shock, where the, the bacteria has not has left the digestive tract and gone into the bloodstream and it becomes a different set of problems like sepsis. It could also cause some damage to the kidneys. There, there are special ones that cause damage to the kidneys. There are other ones like botulism that will cause damage to your nerves. And so depending on what nerves it hits, it may affect things like breathing. But the most common ones are your kidneys, nerve problems, chronic arthritis that could stem you from you know, from, from a simple um, food poisoning disease that goes haywire. I know that when you started, um, you talked about how um, food poisoning occurs. And one of the areas you discussed was how we store food in the fridge. I'd like you to go over that again because there are people who just joined the broadcast now. Very important because again, we just go get these things, load them in the fridge, and we just... Please, let us, talk to us how handling food at home could lead to these dangerous circumstances, some of which we call food poisoning. Okay, so backing up a little bit, there's something we call cross-contamination. So there, there could be food that could be perfectly fine, and you bring it close to food that is contaminated, and it becomes contaminated. And the things that we worry about the most is the length of time that you have to cook food. So if food is already cooked, you have to protect it jealously. If there's food that requires minimal cooking, you also have to protect it. Because when those food gets contaminated, you don't cook them long enough to take care of some of the germs. Although sometimes we have toxins that no amount of cooking would, would destroy. But so when you have food that you need to, even from the store, and I do this a lot, when I go to the store, I always watch when I buy meat products and so on or dairy, I always make sure that they put them separately. And the people look at me as if I'm crazy. I just say to myself, I'm not gonna get sick because of this. I will pay attention. So from the store, when you buy meat and dairy products, things like milk, um, eggs and so on, you want to keep them separate from your fresh foods, things like lettuces and so on. And you also want to keep those separate from the foods that are ready to eat, things like pastries, bread, all those kind of things. The ones that you quickly grab and put in your mouth. And so when you go into your refrigerator, your top of your refrigerator should be, refrigerator should be made up of cooked foods. Because those foods, the most you're going to do with them is pick them up and eat them. So if you have any kind of bacteria in there, you're not going to have you're not going to have the thoughtfulness to cook it long enough to get rid of them. The next layer of storage should be fresh vegetables and produce, things like fruits and and salads and so on. That you're not going to cook them. You may wash them some, but you are not going to cook them. So if there's any bacteria in them, you're, they're probably going to wind up in your system. So you want to keep those next layer. And then the bottom layer should be things like meat and dairy products because those ones are the ones that tend to contaminate a lot of other things. And when you have them, chances are they could drip. You know, you could have some juices coming out of the meat and fish and so on. And if you had it at the top of the fridge and it was dripping, guess where it's going to drip? Onto your salads and your cooked foods, which is basically one of the ways that you cross-contaminate food. So when you're handling that food, in fact, when you go to restaurants, one of the things that we do, because we used to inspect restaurants here in a when I was doing my training in New York. We inspect, we make sure that the food is kept separate. And then even where they prepare the food, the meats have their own sink, and the vegetables and fruits produce have their own sink. Basically, you're not even allowed to bring them next to each other when you're preparing them. Chat Night Africa, if it matters to you, it matters to Chat Night. I met a lady who went to this barbecue, you know, in summer, summer season, 
and four overseas and pretty much in Africa, people organize uh, cookouts. And this lady went and ate this barbecue. I don't know if it was well made. I, I don't know. And she came back and was almost dying at home. She was back home. You would think that some toxins uh, were introduced to, 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 to the barbecue. Tell, tell us a little bit about this cookouts that people organize. How should those things be handled? Chicken, uh, steak. I mean, I love meat. <laughs> I love meat. <laughs> but how should people, what should people do uh, when they see those things that are so appetizing? It's like you should get a good chunk of it in your jaw. What should people do? So the first step is that most of the problem comes from who is handling the food. First of all, that person has to exercise good hygiene. Frequent hand washing, frequent hand washing, they need to keep that food at the right temperatures. If it's not ready to cook, keep it cool, keep it cold or frozen. When you're ready to cook it, you need to defrost it the right way and then cook it quickly. And the recommendation when you're cooking food is that you should have a thermometer, the ones that you use for cooking, where you stick it in the middle of the food, things like poultry and meat and so on. The recommendation is that you cook it up to at least 165 degrees Fahrenheit because you want to make sure that the heat goes all the way into the middle of the food and that it cooks it down. And one of the other things you want to do is cut the meat into smaller pieces because that means that the heat can get to the middle faster. Then um, when they're serving the food or even when they're preparing the food, make sure that you, the spoon or the knives or whatever you're using to handle the raw food, you don't use it on the ready food because whatever was on the raw food is going to come onto the food that is ready to be eaten. And then, of course, when you are serving yourself, make sure that you're minding, you know, proper hygiene, your hands are clean, you're not picking and putting things down. And one of the things I noticed with a lot of cookouts, of course, is that we have a lot of flies running around and people just kind of ignore them. Those flies are nasty insects, man. I don't like them because they carry stuff from one place to the other. And, and, and just being, growing up in Cameroon, I always think about, about pig toilets and flies. And every time I see flies, that's all I think about. Like, I know they just came from poop and now they're coming to my food. I'm not happy. So you have to look at all the steps and make sure again that the food is handled properly, that it's being kept at the right temperatures and that there's proper hand hygiene. And when you go to, you talk about uh, towns, towns, cities, villages in Africa, when people go to beer parlors, you know, you see flies all around the place. <laughs> going from one bottle to another bottle, from one glass to another glass. Now let me ask you a question. Do you go to restaurants even here in the United States? I go sparingly, but I'll tell you one of the things I do because I have done resp restaurant inspections as part of my training. I watch very carefully. I look at what they're doing. What do you inspect when you go out? So one of the first things I look at, even though it may not be 100% good, is the rating on the door of the restaurant. When they put an A rating, it means that they've done most of the things that they need to do to handle food and that they're considered safe for handling food. When it goes down to B and so on, you need to start wondering why did they give them B. If it goes down to a C and stuff, they probably, and when, it, when it's really bad, they just shut down the restaurant. They give you warnings, and if you don't correct them quickly, they shut down the restaurant. So I look at that first, the, the rating. And then when I get in there, I just observe the basic hygiene. I watch what they're doing. I don't like when people touch, food with my, with, touch my food with their hands because I don't know what they've been doing. A lot of people do not um, observe, observe proper hygiene. People use the restroom, they come right out, they may just run a little bit of water over their fingers. You're supposed to wash your hands for at least 20 or 30 seconds, produce some lather, and rinse it right. A lot of people don't take time to do that. So when they come out, I prefer that you handle my food with gloves. I also look at everything you're doing in there. If you're using the spoon, I am very, uh, what do you call it, anal about those things. If I can see places where I see they're doing open cooking, I try to watch what they're doing in the kitchen. I also just pay attention to the hygiene of the, the general hygiene of the people serving the food. And I just look around because a lot of times people that respect their customers will make sure that they're keeping the environment clean, at least what you can see. When, I mean, I learned something today because I, when I go to restaurants with friends, I'm not looking at the doorpost to see if it's an A or a B. So if I understand you, Doc, you are saying when people, when you take friends out, you should watch out for what rating that restaurant has. That's one thing. Another thing that Are they required do to post the rating outside, outside the door? Yes, oh, sir. The, the, okay. the rating is supposed to be there. The other thing is, I'm not going to lie about it. I go and read the reviews about, about, about wherever I want to go because what I tell myself is that somewhere in the middle lies the truth. 
you know, online reviews, if enough people tell me that this place is troublesome, I'm not going to go there. And if you want to go to places, always talk to a few friends. Have you ever been here or have you ever, what do you think about it? And when people tell you don't go there, I mean, I take them seriously because I just, I'm not willing to put my health at risk if I can help it. Now, but assuming that you didn't do, you didn't go online, you just grab some friends along the street and uh, should people be looking at or ask, uh, can you ask, and by law, if you ask, would they tell you what rating the restaurant is? If you're not you asking, where, ask. where, where should you be looking for those ratings? You should be able to ask. Most places, most places will post it on the door or right the front, one of the front windows of the restaurant. They will usually post the rating on there. And if you don't see, just tell them, hey, I'm curious. I know you can't operate this business without the, without the health department coming in here to take a look and see what you're doing. What is your rating? What is your health department rating? And if they don't want to tell you, you can call the health department and tell them, can you please tell me the rating of this particular restaurant? Now you know. Now I know. These are, these are things which we just we just ignore. And we just think that any place, because it looks clean on the outside, should be clean behind, behind the counters, which isn't always the case. Um, fish. You go to buy fish or fresh produce. What should you be looking at, especially where you see all the stockpiles of fish, fresh fish, uh, mackerel, crocker, and all those stuff, catfish? What, what, what should you be looking for? So I'm going to say that with fish, one of the first things you want to look at is how the fish is being stored. A lot of it, fish has to be kept frozen. You really shouldn't be storing fish at, unless it just came right out of the water. But they should still kind of have it in some ice. So that's one of the first things I would look at. And then the other thing you can just ask, even though you probably will not, they will not tell you the truth, is how was this fish, how was this fish harvested? Because sometimes I know, for example, in Limbe, there were cases where they used gamalin to harvest fish. You know, you're not going to be able to tell when you look at the fish. So again, it goes with experience, it goes with talking to people. When you want to go to places, always call friends and ask them. In fact, that's why we do social networking. Hey, have you been here before? Have you bought fish from them before? What do you think about it? Was it okay? Did it make you sick? A lot of times, people that like you and their friends will tell you the truth. Um, let's, uh, at this point, look at you come back from a party and you having stomach gripes, you, you having cramps, you having all kinds of things, stuff like that. What should you do? Uh, what, how do you handle yourself? What should be the first response when you are realizing that hmm, it looks like I had some food poisoning? So the first thing again is acknowledging that you ate something that was because if you didn't eat anything differently or you haven't changed anything that you've eaten lately then you don't have to worry about food poisoning but if you know you ate something different that's the first step you know you can call the restaurant and ask them and tell them hey i got sick from this and that have you heard any again a lot of restaurants will not tell you the truth but you can just call them and say i ate something and i got sick maybe you want to check it and make sure that it's okay because i don't want anybody else to get sick so the next thing and the most important thing is that a lot of these sick illnesses, you can ride them out. Drink a lot of water. You can get some electrolyte fluids like Pedialyte. I always like to recommend Pedialyte because it's made for children and it's pretty safe. You know, we have other things too, like Gatorade. You can drink those because you want to replace whatever you're losing. If you have fevers, you can take some Tylenol or Motrin or at home, you can take some paracetamol. Um, the most important thing is to stay hydrated. And for most people, they're going to ride this out for a day or two make sure you're observing good hand hygiene because whatever is coming out of your body is contaminated and if you don't wash your hands properly you're just going to keep repeating the cycle so good hand washing take it easy with food let your stomach rest but make sure you're drinking enough fluids make sure you get plenty of rest take care of the fever what you start worrying about is if you start getting dizzy you start feeling funny like your nerves are acting funny or you're not you're not really feeling yourself well you feel like something is terribly wrong or you notice that there's blood coming out of your stool or you're throwing up so much or going to the bathroom so much that you can't hold on anything that's when you should get concerned and that's when you should seek medical care you talked about allergies along the line what has allergies got to do or what have allergies got to do with food poisoning what's the nexus so i was surprised when i found out too because i was doing my research on food poisoning and food poisoning basically says any kind of illness that you get after ingesting food mm -hmm. So when you eat something and you have an allergic reaction, technically it's a food poisoning, although the food was not contaminated. So I think they kind of, some places will mention it, but when I went to one of, went to the CDC website and I reviewed it, they did talk about food allergies. 
and it causes people to get sick so it's considered to be a form of you know food poisoning but it's not really because the food is a poison it's because the food is a poison to your body as an individual not in general and how do you prevent these things especially allergies most times people don't know that they are allergic to certain foods and you give peanuts what we call granuts back home to somebody and it's like going to the cemetery with that person how do you know you're allergic to something or not I, I, I mean this might be too broad a question to ask but I have to ask it because we don't know you're absolutely right for most people you're not gonna know you're not gonna know what you're allergic to until you come across it I hate to say that you know even medications when you give them to patients we ask have you ever had this before do you have any allergies like no known drug allergies so we will not know until you try it now there are some ways that you can you can guess if it's something that runs in your family, a lot of people are allergic to certain things, you should kind of assume that you may be allergic. You could say, you know what, my mother, my sisters and so on have this, maybe I have a problem, let me just get myself checked out. Um, I don't know if you have a lot of allergy and immunology services in Cameroon, sometimes they can do what they call food allergy testing, that is very expensive and even here it's not that easily accessible, where they go and they basically check um, for your response to different kinds of foods and chemicals and see how you respond to them. That's the only way you will know for sure, but the truth is that they cannot check for everything. They check for the most common allergen. So it's basically an exposure thing. And if you're also somebody who tends to be allergic to a lot of things, you should kind of assume that they are, you could be allergic to the most common things. What you can really do is, one, make sure that the people around you know that you tend to have allergies. Make sure that they, they do not bring around the things that tend to cause common, common allergies. And then also make sure that you have a contingency plan. So for example, if it's just a low-grade allergy, you can have some Benadryl with you. But if you're somebody that has severe allergies, you want to make sure that you have your ATP with you at all times. Somebody watching this broadcast from the streets of uh, Lilongwe, Boya, Ngelemenduka, Ongulemakong, or Kaduna, or somewhere in Oweri, Nigeria, would be asking, if you went to the market and bought vegetables, we have things like Okombong in Cameroon, water leaf, mm -hmm. uh, what we call water leaf, um, cabbage, carrots, all those things. What, what should you really do to avoid food poisoning? I have heard people go to the market, buy bitter leaves, what we call bitter leaves, come back home, cook it, eat it, and then they're having a running stomach all day. So, what went wrong? Was it the handling of the food or the way it was cooked or the way it may have been stored? It could be any one of those things. Give me a second to drink some water. So it could be any one of those things. It could be that right from when it came out of the farm, it was already contaminated. And then as it's sitting around the market, in the warm market for that matter, the bacteria just grow. By the time the person takes it home, it's enough to make them sick. So even when they wash it, it's still not enough to get rid of everything. Especially again, if you have toxins that have already been released on that food. So it's hard to tell, but that's why we have public health. Because when people buy those things, Usually, it's not just going to be one person who gets sick. A lot of people will say, I bought Peter Lee from so and so person and I got sick. Again, if you have a good healthcare system, what they do is that they start investigating. They start please? investigating. Yeah, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. They start investigating to see what's going on. And uh, that way, they can prevent future illnesses from that contaminated food. Here's a question from Andine Jike Ojong Orok. If Hello. in Africa. Yeah, if in Africa we, uh, if in Africa with no p uh, Pedialyte or Gatorade, what can we make at home to help, uh, you know, to, in other words, she's asking for something you can do at home. At that home, replaces, yes. Yeah, that replaces the, yeah, yeah, right. So I know when I was growing up, there was something my dad used to say all the time. You make something with some salt, some sugar, and I think some lemon or lime. And, and mix it in, in, um, set in different uh, quantities and, and just basically get, it, get the whoever is throwing up or having all the symptoms to keep drinking. What, uh, I mean, we've been discussing this for the, for the last uh, 50 minutes. What in your view is or are things that people don't know or should know about food poisoning them? I'm um. giving you a blank check. <laughs> Wow, um, that's pretty interesting. So I think one thing I want to tell you is that you can't spend your time being worried about the poison. You should understand it, you should be proactive, but you 
cannot completely prevent it. You can avoid it as much as possible and you can also do whatever you can to reduce the risk of it happening. So from your own end, if you are handling, if you are preparing food or planting or growing food, please keep in mind that you can make a lot of people sick and you can actually kill some people by the way you grow your food. So if you are the one planting this food, make sure that you are getting water from the right sources. Make sure that you know what is around your farm. You want to make sure that there are no sewage um, plants around there, that you don't have any contaminants. I'll give you an example. In uh, Buffalo, New York, which is where I did my training, we had we have a lot of problems with uh, chemicals that are seeping from from uh, World War II materials that were buried in the ground. They seep into the water, and then you have a lot of big companies that also came in there. They contaminated the soil, the water with many different things, and they left. And these things, until this day, are still a problem there. So. If you want to go and start farming in these areas, you need to kind of be aware that these are things that are going on. You have to educate yourself. You need to reach out to community groups and ask them. We have things like the Environmental Protection Agency. We have independent environmental groups that are going around making sure that they are protecting a lot of the resources, the, the natural resources that people have to use. So that's the first step. The next step is that when we're transporting food, we need to become aware. You need to know the kind of foods that get bad easily. Again, we talked about it. A lot of the animal foods, like the, the, the poultry, the meat, the turkey, the, the um, eggs, the dairy, those are the things that tend to be the most, the most easily contaminated. And then we have the fresh produce too. And some of them could get contaminated on the farm or they could get cross-contaminated. So the next thing you want to do, apart from protecting the source of the food, is knowing the foods that are more likely to cause problems. Like classic, when you go to a party, when I sing dole, I don't mess with it. I don't know who fixed it and how they handled it. And I don't know how long it's been stored at the wrong temperature. So just be aware of the kind of foods that can cause food poisoning. Salads, a lot of things that are made with, with, um, with things like cream. You want to avoid them as much as possible. So that's the next step. And then, of course, in your own way, when you're handling food, please exercise good hygiene. If you're sick and you have a lot of things, please running or you have diarrhea, please wash your hands 100 times. You're going to make people sick and it's really not nice. Um, so that's one of the things you can do when you're serving yourself, make sure that you're aware of what you're using to serve yourself and that you're not moving things back and forth and contaminating food. And I really think that's really, that's really it. And then of course, we need to have good health departments or good policies to help um, proactively invest, monitor, protect and investigate any outbreaks and try to see what it can do to prevent future ones. Dr. B. Uh, Tatsong uh, from Udan. I am you, you are my guest this evening and you're specialized in preventive. Health. Now, you talked about uh, water, and mo most times people buy bottled water because they think that tap water is to be avoided. Is bottled water always the safe way? The safe not necessarily. Route? Not necessarily. Uh, First of all, why we not? know. We know that a lot of companies, a lot of companies tell lies about the source of the water. A lot of people actually, even in Cameroon, we know that. We know places where people take empty bottles and they rebottle the water from wherever and they, and they sell it. So just because it's bottled doesn't really mean anything. And then the other thing you have to think about is that uh, the plastic bottles, they tend to have their own issues with contamination from the plastic, depending on how they've been stored. So you may have those long-term contaminants or the short-term contaminants or basically just water that is not as clean as they say it is it is so when you're traveling or you're out there you want to make sure that your water you personally boil your water very well or if you're buying bottled water you want to buy it from a trusted source that is known to sell authentic product products and the reason why i ask you those that question about bottles of water is you go to this chain chain stores i'm going to i'm not going to name them here and you <laughs> find all kinds of bottles and people are jostling over that Thinking that, well, it, and, and to, their, to them, they, they they are buying spring water, and and when I told one person that all the water that you find in bottles and isn't always spring water, they were surprised to hear that for me. Very so true. That that's right. So if you're going to drink, if you're going to buy bottled water because you think it's necessarily spring water, it is not. Very you ought to read it very very well uh doc we have 10 minutes or so to go about no seven minutes to go um what other information in your area of specialization would you like to share 
related to this topic before, actually before we go. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about public health because we take it for granted. But truly, we live with public health. Public health is another part of your life. After God, public health is pretty much the next thing that you have to deal with. Because public health is intimately involved in everything about your environment and your life. From the water you drink, from your sewage systems, from the houses you live in, the places where you work, the school where you play, we are into all of those things. The food you eat, the water you drink, we are into all of those things. So I want you to start paying attention to your public health departments, making sure that they are functioning properly, making sure that the people that are charged with protecting the health of the public are doing the things that they are supposed to do. I know one of the problems that we deal with in Cameroon and a lot of our African countries is corruption. And I want to encourage the people that have been committed to caring for the health of the public to please stay away from that stuff. You could get killed, your family could get killed, and other innocent people could get killed if you don't do what you're supposed to do. Please be diligent. When you go to take care of, when you go to inspect places, don't take something under the table and turn a blind eye to a problem. People's lives depend on you doing the right thing. Chat Night Africa and my guest tonight has been Dr. B. Tatsong Fomundam. Again, I would like to extend my very warm thanks, congratulations, appreciations to your dad, Tatsong Ebende, for the spectacular job he did while he was government delegate to the Bermuda Urban Council. When people get appointed, they really don't feel that they have an obligation to do that. But he kept Bamenda clean. It was really one of the cleanest, if not the cleanest town in the entire country. Uh, so I am sure, I hope that he's watching this broadcast, but if it's not, please extend my thank you, my thank you to him. Uh, he did a wonderful job. Now, Doug, imagine that I came to your house this evening. What is the message in bullet point format that you would want Divine to take home in a basket? Call it basket of information on food poisoning. What should people take home as we round off on the show today? So food poisoning is a very common problem. In fact, I would say about one out of every five people will suffer from food poisoning every year. A lot of people. And I will say that a small percentage of those people will wind up in the hospital and an even smaller percentage will die. How do you know that you could be at risk? People that are younger, younger children, like below five, older people above um, 65, pregnant women, and people that have compromised immune systems for different reasons, chronic illnesses. So if you're one of those people, you should know that you're especially susceptible to food poisoning. Now, the other thing you need to know is that food poisoning doesn't just happen because somebody put something in your food. There are so many ways that you can get food poisoning. So be mindful, keep your eyes open, learn, pay attention, pay attention to what is going on with your food. And, and one thing I'm also encouraging now because I'm learning a lot more too every day is that we need to start, we need to let people around us know how food goes from the, from the farm to the table. When you see how it goes, you, you start understanding all the things that could go wrong. You can see how people are making mistakes along the way that could become a problem for you down the road. And then of course, the most important message with food poisoning is hand washing. That is the biggest thing with public health, hand washing. You can avoid a lot of problems. Even if food is contaminated, it doesn't have to keep spreading because a lot of times things spread when they go from poor hygiene to the food. So let's keep that in mind. Um, Let's also realize the other thing, important thing you want to know is know the difference between when you can ride out an illness and when you should see a doctor. And I kind of emphasized that before. If you just have simple diarrhea, you know, grumbling stomach or cramping, pain, or you're having a little bit of vomiting and nausea, low grade fever, that is something that you can ride out, especially if it doesn't go beyond a day or two. If you start exceeding that number of days, then you have to really start getting worried. And if you also start having more severe symptoms, because there are other kinds of food poisoning that can do that. And I don't want to bore you with all of that information. I can give you uh, resources or I can send some to Mr. Nchamukong to give that to you on how to identify. Um, this? Yeah, pregnant go ahead. Women, pregnant women, one of the biggest problems they have to worry about is listeria. Listeria is found in a lot of dairy products when they're unpasteurized. So when, one of the things to tell pregnant women is stay away from foods that have not been properly um, <coughs> They have not been properly um, handled, especially when it comes to killing the germs, pasteurization, and so on. For pregnant women, if you have that kind of food poisoning, you can quickly lose your baby. You can have an instant abortion. So that is for um, taking it up for babies. You 
below one year old, you don't want to give them things that contain honey because honey can cause what we call botulism. You know the thing that goes in Botox where they, they inject it in your face and it relax the muscles? The reason is because it literally kills the nerves of those muscles. So you don't want to give that to babies because it can actually kill the baby or put them into a lot of cardiorespiratory distress. So I think those are the few bullet points that we need to take home. And again, the last thing is how you store your food. From the store, make sure that you're separating your food. You want to avoid cross-contamination. Studies have shown that people actually get more food poisoning from home food food than from restaurants because in restaurants, restaurant, they kind of put pressure on them to keep their environment clean, especially here, maybe at home not as much. So at home, we don't have that kind of pressure. We think, oh, okay, I'm the one cooking the food. I know what I'm doing. I can just put it anywhere I want. You're going to make yourself sick. You're going to make your family sick. And you're going to make your guests or anybody else that comes in contact with your food sick. So please keep that in mind. You need to learn how to handle your food properly and store them at the right temperatures. And remember that, especially in warm weather, food goes bad very quickly. And it's because food rots faster. Bacteria. Warm weather just means that it's the perfect temperature for bacteria and germs to multiply. So when you have that, this warm weather, you should be even more careful with food. I find that when you have very cold weather, you can keep food outside for a long time and it doesn't, you don't have as many problems. As soon as it gets hot, food sours and rots very quickly. And that's because of the stuff that is happening to the food. And that means that before it sours and rots, you're already having buildup of germs, bacteria and toxins and, uh, and uh, also parasites. So you want to really avoid that. Um, keep them at the right temperatures. Cold food, store them below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Hot food, you want to keep them above 140. Um, degrees Fahrenheit and then cook food to the right temperatures. And I think that should be about it. Huh. Dr. B. Tazam uh, <laughs> uh, listening to you is like reading a library of Congress. I mean, reading all the textbooks there. Um, I want to thank you so much, but before you go, um, I I'd like you to share this information again. I know it sounds like repetition, but sometimes you have to say something over and over and over. People are planting stuff, especially tuber crops, near uh, sewage, ta uh, septic tanks and so on, especially back home. What message do you have for them? People planting tomatoes, planting yams, cocoa yams and all those things around pit latrines, around septic tanks and so on. Please, I would like you to repeat that. So that is one of the common ways that food gets contaminated while it is still in the soil. So this food basically has no chance of doing right by anybody. When you plant, you don't know what people had in their stool when they released it from their bodies. You have no idea. Some of the stool is contaminated and then even by virtue of being stool, it's decomposing. You have all kinds of bacteria and stuff growing in there. When you have that stuff and near septic tanks, most of those things are untreated. When you're planting your food there, you're putting yourself at risk because when liquids from the from the from the disease seep through the soil they carry a lot of things with them and they carry them into your food so basically when you're planting near these places you're not giving yourself a chance to even have good food you may think that you're getting good manure but that is not in your best interest i think one of the ways to get good manure is just to start composting again let's become sustainable put a lot of foods that you eat and that's basically organic a lot of the foods that we eat you can just get a composting thing and put it in, the, in your backyard and use that for manure. Use grass and all the other things that are growing around your house. You really don't want feces to be the manure that you use. Unless you are a thousand percent sure that this feces is, is, is not contaminated. And how can you be so sure? And i like you to also reiterate for you go to ceremonies, occasions, social occasions. You find people sneezing in their palms. Um, and then they sneeze in their palms. They have a handshake. You go grab that groundnut and you are eating. Please, can you just show us how people should be sneezing? I watch this and, and, and people do this, they don't know. I don't want to be, I'm not a doctor. I'll tell you how to do it. I'll do this. Well, Mr. Um, Chamukong, you're absolutely right. When you sneeze here, most we do, we do not give people handshakes to their elbows. So sneeze in there so you're protecting the sneeze so you don't spread it. And also it's not going on your hands. And the other thing I tell people over and over, and I'm saying all about it, we ask people when they tell you, I drive the crazy. Wash your hands. Wash your hands because you don't know what people have been doing with their hands. Some people have been sneezing, some people have been in the toilet, some people have been touching things that they have no business touching, and they're going to come right there and shake your hands without any shame. Please wash your hands. Thank you so much. <laughs> and please, when you go to parties, don't talk over food. You, you find people, they go to parties, 
it's time to go to 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 the tables where food is to dish food and people are just having chat just chatting over food that's right i, I find that so offensive i don't know and people do this they don't know they, they, they don't know what's getting on the food as you're talking you that's don't, right do, do you have to get that have that conversation about how nice that food is over that food you are dishing please when you go to dish your food at parties do not talk over food dish your food take it to your table or pull your friend as your friend aside and then you can begin to say how delicious that food is please don't talk over food you have something to add in this in this light dog well no i'm just smiling because you're absolutely right but i'm going to be honest with you mr chamukong you know the reason we're having these conversations is because a lot of people are not aware of the mistakes they're making Mm -hmm. And sometimes we grow up in cultures. I'm going to give you a classic one. We grow up in a culture where people pick their nostrils on a regular basis. People stick their hands in their, in their behinds on a regular basis and they don't think it's a big deal. But you know that that is a problem because we all carry a lot of bacteria in our nostrils and not to talk of back there. And people dig and they, then they just come and touch food. So we need to talk about these things so that people become more aware and more sensitive. And we need to also start, you know, if like that, I'll tell them. I'm not afraid to tell you because one thing I'm determined to do is not allow you to make me or anybody else sick. So again, I can't prevent everything, but I, we can train the people around us and start with the children. When you want change, you want to start with when they're really young and kind of work your way up. I believe in training children because if you can train the children, you're going to have a generational change in a heartbeat. It happened even in America. You know, I worked with this gentleman, he's an uh, endocrinologist, and I remember he told me, he said, when my parents grew up, they used to throw trash right out the window. Now, we all know coming here now that you don't do that. But it's because they started from the children and they said, put the trash in the trash can. Don't throw out the window. So within one generation, they have completely changed the conversation. It's true with hygiene. It's true with public health, protection of our food sources. Let's start training our children from inside the house. And please, when you visit the restroom, you go to a restaurant or you go to a shopping center, you visit the restroom, please wash your hands. When you're done using the uh, whatever facilities you have, you went there. Wash your hands. Let me tell you something. Good character is doing the right thing when nobody's watching. <laughs> Dad, um, I got this mom who is probably listening to you. Uh, they have young children. You talked about cereal. You, you, you go buy the cereal, whatever. What should moms with young children bear in mind when, they are, when they're going to buy those breakfast uh, cereals no i mean what should they have in mind so again there's nothing like having good information because honestly speaking if you don't have the information you can't act upon it you need to go out there and start educating yourself that's why mr chambukong let me just throw this in there when we're talking about public health we need to talk about women's rights because most of the times it is women that run little farms, it is women that run the home, they are the ones who determine what goes on the table and how it gets there. So if you want to be eating healthy and to live healthy and to avoid illness, you need to make sure that your whoever is handling your food, which is most, mostly the women, is smart about handling food. So if you have your wife at home raising the children and she doesn't know anything about food, I wish you well. You know? So it is not in the best interest of our people to not allow people to learn, allow them to learn. This mother, when you when you go out there, read about stuff, you know, pay attention, read the news, go to um, talk to people, ask questions. When you go to the, to the when you, I mean, the only way is just to keep, pay attention, keep your head close to the ground. I read a lot of stuff, I pay attention. And then if you're here in the U.S., you can sign up for, um, you, I think it's FDA, they, they send you recall notices, they send warnings about different products. And they will send them to you and you can always call the hotline and ask them about it. If you're really concerned about something, you can go to the National Poison Center or you can call the USDA or there. These are places that are paid for with our taxes. You can ask questions. I don't know what agencies we have in Cameroon. Ask questions. Do not be afraid to ask. Your life depends on it. And when you meet your doctor, ask questions. I know that we, a lot of us are from the tradition that you don't ask your doctor questions. You sit in front of your doctor and you don't ask questions. Please. If, if, ask questions. Be in a conversation with your doctor. It's only then your doctor can help you. I mean, Dr. B. Tazong Pumunda will confirm what I'm saying. You don't sit in front of your doctor and say nothing. Share, talk with your doctor. Question, doc, why am I taking this? Why am I to do this? Why am I taking this medication, not this one? Ask your doctor 
questions. Um, I think that's what we have to, we had this uh, evening for chat night. Again, you'll be coming back uh, for many, many other things. Thank you, my friend, for accepting to come on chat night uh, for the first time. This is your first participation. And so many people are watching and sharing this broadcast to groups. You wouldn't believe where you are now. Your voice is now being echoed, doctor. You, you're saving lives. Can I say something real quick, sir? Absolutely. I just want to say thank you to everybody who is listening. I want to thank Dr. Michael Noe. He was my program director in preventive medicine. Because, you know, um, those are the people that gave us the opportunity to train in preventive medicine. And it means the world to me. If he's anywhere hearing this, I'm sure he's going to hear it someday, somehow. I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to all my professors that taught me, that pushed us to study and to learn and to understand. I want to thank you to all the people that have been supportive. I just want to say thank you. I appreciate you and I hope that what I express today is going to add value to your life and it's going to make you look at things a little differently and stay safer and healthier. Thank you so much. If it matters to you, it matters to us. If you're doing something that's changing lives, please let us know. We would like to take people like you on Chat Night Africa because change begins with us. It begins with you, where you are doing the things you can with the little you have. That's where change begins. That's how together, collectively, we can have the results that all of us are yearning for. Doc, thank you so much. My name is uh, Divine Chamukum. That's been Chat Night Africa. And I had uh, Dr. B. Tatsong Omundam as my guest. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. Thank you. And you can continue to post your questions. Dr. B. Chalzong Komundam will be uh, will be answered. Again, let me repeat. If you have any questions related broadcast, please post the question. Post the question and Dr. B. Tatsong Fomundam will be coming back to answer the question. Let us be in Chat Night Africa with your host Divine Chia We don't Chat Night Africa, the power of Chat Night. We weaponize you with information because information is power. That's why I'll come back again next Sunday for yet another effervescent broadcast. I'm coming. I'm dancing. I'm dancing. We're going to dance. We're going to dance. Chat Night Africa matters that matter. If it matters to you, it matters to Chat Night. A man and why indeed John Tanto match fire. They have been my production directors, studio director Beatrice Formunen. Share this broadcast. Share this broadcast. If you came in late, please go back to the beginning to watch. We have valuable information on the show. And this broadcast will be posted on my wall. I will be back again. I will come back. That's for Chat Night Africa Live from Washington, D.C., metropolitan area. Thank you for watching. Merci à tout le monde. Merci, merci, thank you. Bye bye. That has been Chat Night.